Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience. Third computer is a charm. Welcome to the final presentations for Capstone Projects. I'm very excited uh, to have everybody here, both in the classroom and all the friends and family who are able to join in Zoom. Uh, so I want to quickly welcome our faculty panel um, before we get started. Uh, Danny Rankin, Matt Bethencourt, Annie Margaret, and Eileen Pierce, thank you all so, so much for being here. Uh, today, our final presentations, and they're not pitches, they're final, well, they are pitches, actually, the final actual representation of your capstone projects will be six to eight minutes long with two to three minutes for feedback, which means that we'll probably only have time for one of the faculty panel to give feedback per presentation. Um, I will have a kind of yellowish green card that I hold up for all of you if you have a minute left and a kind of red hot pink card if your time is up, okay? Um, the order of the presentations I have shared with all the students, if any of you guys have any questions, just send me an email right now, okay? Um, but otherwise, I think we're ready to go. Are there any questions before we get started? All right, so let me pull up the first presentation. All right. Hello, and welcome to Brain Power, interactive animated short film. I'm Delaney, and these are my teammates, Gino and Allie, who will get this road on the show. <laughs> Thanks, Delaney. <laughs> um, so we're going to be starting off our presentation by sharing our statement of intent. The main focus of our project was to show a more authentic side of ADHD, thereby promoting both the empathy and understanding of it. This intent was carried into our elevator pitch, which we have shown here. Our capstone project, Brain Power, is a physically interactive experience that allows AR viewer to step inside of an animated short film in order to experience what it's like to be a person living with ADHD. So what does this actually mean for our project? Our project focused around an animated short film that was viewed in a third grade testing environment where users would interact with an Arduino button. Our viewers would walk into our classroom, entering the world of our main character, Moru. Little did our viewers know they would be joining Moru and completing a math exam that soon felt like an impossible task. Now, to talk about the inspiration that went into this concept, I'm gonna go ahead and let Gina take over. Yeah, thank you. So the precedence for appropriate mental illness in animation is limited at best. The primary precedence and inspiration for our project is the Pixar animated short, Loop. This was only released last year, um, serving as a beneficial start to this important representation. Otherwise, this precedence for our project has been limited to infographics and other informational media um, without any real characters or story at their core. The limited precedence and lack of appropriate, appropriate ADHD representation has driven our project forward um, as we attempt to contribute our own story of the character Moru. This required a huge amount of research into the details of the animation studio pipeline in both 2D and 3D to gain a better understanding for what may be possible and most effective. Yeah, so we utilized this animation research to begin building 3D characters and environment assets, according to the studio workflows. Ultimately, Moru's story was told most effectively following a 2D animation pipeline instead. This allowed us to build on those 3D assets in a more efficient pipeline that was specific to our project's needs. <laughs> Now, Delaney will discuss our character and storyline. As we began developing our main character, we wanted Moro to be relatable to any viewer and therefore wanted to avoid any specific human features. Thus, we decided to make our characters monsters, which take form as a more abstract depiction of human beings. Because we wanted the viewer to connect with Moru, we wanted to focus on a gender neutral character, but we ultimately decided to make her more feminine 
as there are very few depictions of women and girls with ADHD. As far as our original storyline, we started off with the goal of showing what ADHD looks like, but as it is a varied and complex experience, we decided to focus on how taking an exam feels in order to build empathy for someone with ADHD. Similarly to the development with our characters, as we created and reworked the, experience, the script, we wanted to ensure the story was understandable for people that do not experience ADHD without alienating those who do. With the physical room, we wanted to further strengthen the connection between the viewer and the main character. We decorated and placed furniture in the room to recreate Maury's testing environment and had the user view the short film in this space by themselves. We additionally implemented an interactive component with the room. Yeah, so as Delaney said, the second part to our interactive classroom was this interactive component. Um, this originally began as a pencil that would lift and start the animation, um, but we really wanted to continue this interactive experience throughout the film. Um, that's how we came up with our focus button. Our viewer would interact with this button alongside Moru, facing exam questions that Moru was facing and giving different feedback responses based on whether Moru was successfully finishing a problem or whether they were stuck and unable to complete it. And now we're going to show you a quick video of what our final project looked like. The user starts by walking into the room, sitting at the desk, and beginning to watch the short film alone. They're motivated to help more focus on the exam, and as time progresses, irritation builds as they are unable to make her focus. Despite the outside encouragement, Moru still struggles to focus, but the teacher gives her more time. The interaction is designed to intentionally steer the user away from feeling triumphant because ADHD is frustrating. It's not something that can be fixed and ultimately external pressure does not make someone focus. And that wraps up our final project. Thank you all so much for your time today. We're going to open the floor for questions now. I'm going to admit Annie here and see if I could ask you guys to open up Zoom for quick. Uh, so the, the Zoom participants can hear the feedback. Oh, oh sorry. I'll, I got it. I got sorry. you. No worries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great job, you guys. Um, I'm curious about if you got after this was finished, if you got feedback from people or user testing with people who have ADHD and what they said about whether this experience was representative or. Sorry, <laughs> a lot of what we ended up talking about um, was how this experience almost is this feeling of recognition maybe um less like a oh gosh what's happening like a oh i know what this is like so that's kind of what i wanted to implement in terms of this um we didn't have many people that had adhd that were able to experience this so kind of that's more from my take of what i would have felt per se any other questions or comments or you want to we have yeah. i mean so as you're developing it though did you talk to other people with yeah, um, I mean, we did definitely use Allie's uh, thought process because a lot of the story is based around her experience with taking tests, but we did talk to my friend who has ADHD and uh, was also diagnosed later in life than a lot of people are. And he said to kind of focus on specific parts of ADHD and not, not try to do everything because we were kind of struggling with the storyline, trying to figure out what to show of ADHD. So I think that definitely helped. Um, and then he said to focus on kind of what the message should be. And if we are trying to show that it's fixed or if we're trying to show that it's hard or something and we ended up going with how frustrating and Unsolvable ADHD is. Any other questions or comments? Great job, you guys. Thank you so much. All right, here we go. Next up. I love it. 
Okay. Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Daniel. And this is our Project 11s. So the story behind why this came to be is all of my mom's family is in Denmark, which leads to us not interacting much other than Skype calls and a very expensive trip every couple of years. I grew up playing this card game from Elva with my Danish family whenever we visited, and we both thought, why not have this available online to play during these Skype calls, as well as sharing it with friends and other family. And here is what we eventually came up with. So the aim of Elevens is to bring fun and excitement to friends and family across the world by developing a digital version of an old card game. By making a digital version, we're able to bring people together without needing to be in the same room, giving them the feeling of huga. Huga is a Danish word that is generally used to mean cozy, comfortable contentedness, and it's usually with friends and family. A weapon is, is a digitization of the European card game from Mel Everett, with the goal of connecting cultures and generations of families and friends, offering that fun feeling that comes with playing the game together, but in a remote environment. The goal of the game is to get rid of all your cards by placing placing them with light colored cards in descending or ascending order from the number 11. Our project is much like versions of popular card and board games such as Uno, Chess, Scrabble, and Monopoly. Taking a physical game and translating it into a digital game has the benefits of allowing people to play practically anywhere and with anyone. We started out with some early prototyping to get ourselves familiar with the softwares we, we intended to use for our project. So on the top left is an initial prototype that was used for the first UX testing. And on the bottom right is what we created for a more pleasing and understandable layout after all of that UX testing. And then with this knowledge, we started working on the technical aspects of the game. Here we have an early functioning prototype based on our designs and early technical work. Overall through the process, we learned that coding is a lot more about debugging than writing actual code. This mixed with trying to implement the designs we laid out made for a real challenge, but we were able to overcome it and to refine this in, into this. And then while this was happening, we also did the UX design in the technical creation of the game, which ended up having this display. And then here is a video of enjoying the game with your friends at the comfort of your own home with snacks and ambience to give that feeling of fuga. Yeah. You can't hear it, but our player is going, woo! And it's exactly. <laughs> it's actually Delaney. <laughs> and that's exactly what we're uh, what we're going for. Invoking that exciting excitement of having fun playing a game with friends creates the dynamic of Hugo that we want to bring to, to the players. And here what and here's what it looks like for those players on their screen. So here's a recording of a player looking through their hand, finding no playable cards, and they draw a card, and it's an 11. Yay, they could play their cards now. So they play that card, and because they're nice, they decide to place down the 12 as well. And then after that, they end their turn. Here we have an example of seeing players switch turns. This is indicated by the switching of the gold outline to the players whose current turn it is. Also, if you look closely at the number on the deck next to the player's name, you notice that the numbers increase and decrease. This is correlated with the amount of cards in the corresponding player's name. Get your hand to zero and win the game and earn your great win rights. Thank you for checking out 11s, find it at the itch link on the screen. And now we'll take any questions and feedback. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I'm in your video, so you know that I played your game. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, this is a this is a fun project and I, you know, applaud you for getting, you know, network card play worked out. That's really a, a challenging thing to get without a lot of bugs and hiccups. So that's that's nice work. I think um, the biggest thing and, and we talked a little bit about it, but like one of the things with a game like this is like not just representing the game online, but also since you're taking away a certain like embodied element, what sort of things can you add 
to this side of play experience. And like some of it would be functionally things that computers can do faster and better than people, which is like sorting cards, which would have been something that I'd like to see like easily integrated because that makes the game hard to play, which I noticed for myself. Um, but like you also spaced out the, U the UI elements after that session and I think that really helps. And, and yeah, I can see this being fun. I would say almost if you're trying to get that sort of like atmospheric Huga thing to happen too, it might be worth thinking about like letting people almost customize or make more kind of like fun to the space online itself, right? You've staged it in a way that it's fun to see that, but I'd love to see if that's really a, a core value of the design uh, that could be worked into the overall appearance, even if it's just themes of what you want to make the game look like for yourself or something like that, or some sort of like interactive object besides the game since you've already networked it. But either way, uh, it, it works and you did it and good job. So rock and roll. Yeah. Thank you. Second. All right, here we go. Next up. All right. Um, hi, my name is Maggie Ryan, and this is my project, Dissension. Okay. Um, Dissension is a four player turn based strategic board game with a web app attached, which is intended to reduce packaging waste and allow for less tedious scorekeeping. Um, the inspiration and research for this game came from a lot of different places. Um, I've been a lifetime player of board games like Dominion, Seven Wonders, Small World, D&D, Flux, um, Settlers of Catan, and many, many more. Uh, these games really inspired a lot of the mechanics that ended up in Dissension and are overall just really good games to play, in my opinion. <laughs> I also looked into digital sources such as the Sims, Civs games, um, Sims and Diablo. I think civilization especially um, lent itself to the mix between board games and digital games that I was looking into creating. Um, this brings me to my last piece of research, QR codes, which I spent a lot of time on but ended up scrapping because we found it to be overall just a worse player experience. Um, which brings me to my initial prototypes. Um, this was the initial mock-up for the web app. Um, it was much plainer and with a more static feel. Um, as you can see on here, it's really hard to read a lot of the text because the color options were just not that great. Um, and you can see that it still has the QR reader on the middle screen and an excessive amount of spots in the inventory screen. Um, the board design hasn't changed that much, but you can see that the QR codes are still included on this one. Um, I also spent a large amount of time in spreadsheets, um, simply planning out all of the instructions, house descriptions, um, tile cards, and pretty much everything else, <laughs> which has changed a lot along the way, um, which is in even more spreadsheets, um, which brings me to my final prototype, or I guess the final product of Dissension. Um, yay, Dissension. <laughs> You're the leader of a house in the turbulent realm of Dissension. Explore, gather items, and please your patron. Knowing the unique advantages of your house could push you to victory while forgetting them could cost you everything. First, players choose a fantastical house to play as, each with its own unique characteristics. Players interact with the play space, both by moving their pieces on the physical game board um, and also by using the connected web app, which stores all of their information. Um, let's go ahead and play a turn with a player who just chose the Kirin as their house. Every turn has three important steps, um, move, tile set interaction, and sacrifice. Um, every player starts in a back diamond tile and can move to any tile adjacent to theirs. <clears throat> Um, this includes the diamond and, sorry, <laughs> and octagonal tiles. Um, we're watching the red player here, um, who decides to move back to another octagonal tile, which is outlined in red, um, and which makes it a military specialization tile. Um, Dissension has four different specialization or octagonal tile types. Um, first of which is military cards. Um, military cards give players military strength points, which will help them win the war, um, which happens at the end of every round. 
um, which they can signify on their app. Sorry, I'm like running out of breath. <laughs> um, which they signify on their app on the end screen. Um, and then research cards, which give players cool perks like extra spots in their bags, um, extra animals, weapons, and other things. Um, faith cards give players cool rewards when their patron is happy, that is, and <laughs> being sacrificed too. Otherwise, you probably won't get something too great. Um, and then husbandry cards give players a certain amount of coins each turn, and they can be sacrificed to the player's patron um, to improve what faith cards they're getting. Back to our player to interact with their tiles. Players go to the play screen of their app. Um, and our red player pulls the slingshot, which we can see is then placed into their inventory. Um, the red player's turn is now over and we go to the green player who moves forward onto an action tile. Um, and action tiles are essentially the wild cards of dissension. They don't fit into any category and they can give effects that range from very, very good to very, very bad. They can also affect multiple players. <laughs> Um, the green player pulls, there's no place like home. Um, and then he moves again because action tiles are unlimited. <laughs> um, and then he pulls a blue fox, which again goes into their inventory as all animals and military cards do. This is the end of the green player's turn. Um, and we're gonna fast forward through the other two players' turns. Um, now it's the end of the round. Each player will end the round on their app, um, choosing their place in the war. The app will calculate all points from animals, own tiles, um, and then the war, <laughs> and reset all the weapons for the next round. Um, and that is dissension. Thank you very much. <laughs> we could both talk about it. We'll be fast. OK. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you know, we've been looking at, I, you know, that I've been looking at this project for a while, and I think that um, you've done a really good job in terms of how you've presented this as like the primary benefit of the app in this case is dealing with the tedium that is inevitable in like deep strategy games, right? And now that I've seen an interaction, you know, loop through this thing, I see a lot of the references you talk about, specifically Seven Wonders, there's a lot of, a lot of those yeah. references, which is great, so I mean, it's a great precedent. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's always annoying in games like that when you have to deal with the stress of like what numbers and the things. So like, I think that's the strongest way to, to look at that. And even in talking about this in future spaces, emphasizing that as like, a, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to like write this down and draw tokens and do all this stuff and making this companion thing really like sells, I think that game in that space, which is really good. So yeah, I think I leave one of it. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, Maggie, great, great job. Uh, I had a question. You talked about how you did not go with QR codes um, because they didn't, uh, whatever, test well. What did you, what, what replaced them? So if I were to buy Dissension, like how would I find out about the web app for the scoring? Absolutely. Um, the web app would probably like in a commercial format would probably just be available. Like there probably would be like a QR code on the box that would be through the app store for the app itself. Um, but people found them to be just like very annoying in the sense that like every single time you do a tile, you would have to like scan, wait for oh. the scan to complete. And then it, that's like the pulling mechanic. So I replaced that with the box. Oh, um, okay, got it. <laughs> I, I thought the QR code was just to get the app. Oh, I didn't understand yeah. it was for every, oh yes, that would be very annoying. I got it, okay. No, because I was thinking really, if we got anything out of this pandemic, I really think everyone should understand QR codes now. Absolutely. Like if nothing, if nothing else, like my mother-in-law can do QR codes. So I, you know, okay. Um, and then on the app side, um, so was that a prototype or is it actually running or like what's no, the- No, it, it, it actually works. Oh, okay, cool. I just, I wasn't sure. And did you get yeah. feedback um, on it? Uh, as well. Oh yeah, um, I've had the app working for, you know, through all the demos and everything. So when everyone came back on like demo day, they all got to use it. Um, and I have my family play like, test cool. a couple times. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's definitely gone through like several people who have used it. Great, great. Yeah, nice job. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, great job. <laughs>
All right, here we go. Next up. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Alexis McVeigh, and this is Noetic. Oh, All right, so Noetic is a 2D platformer runner game that follows the journey of a player going through the nightmare that is academic anxiety and the difficulty that it brings to make it to the end. Uh, so my intention, um, Noetic will be an experience to allow players to relate uh, or and or see in a new light how anxiety can play a big factor within a student's ability to complete a set goal. So with my precedents, there were a lot of games uh, that I could find that had um, a, an impression on me with, and with what I wanted to create. Um, one, the two that were the most uh, like dominant were probably Skullburn and Trance. Um, Skullburn is a simple platformer, uh, looks almost like a Game Boy type game. Uh, and it, it really inspired uh, how I wanted to design at first. Um, and I thought it was a nice platformer to get a basis on. Then I found Trance, which is another platformer game uh, that I thought related more to my design and what I wanted, and as well as like the theme and aesthetic of the overall game. Um, Trance is about like a girl who wakes up having to fight those that she loves uh, through a nightmare. And I found a lot of inspiration for both my purpose in this in my game. Um, I feel like both had like the nightmare aesthetic and could be darker than most games can be. And I really enjoyed Trance and wanted to make that like my uh, inspiration. So my initial process, um, initially things were going to be multi-level, uh, you know, multi-themes, um, different levels of, uh, you know, mental health that I could be looking through. Um, I wanted lots of interaction, lots of enemies, bosses, um, and these are some of my like beginning uh, kind of uh, concept sketches of what I wanted to do. Um, so I definitely had a lot of ambition uh, to begin with for this game, um, and it did change drastically here. So in the end, I decided, you know, no three levels. I'm going to do one main level focused on anxiety, um, especially within like an academic setting. Um, I did one long demo that features like, you know, the enemies and instead decided to do a task um, to find like a key to get to the end. Um, so that way the player had one goal and had different mechanics, different distractions that kind of kept them from reaching that goal. Um, so I focused on the ac academic anxiety and how that could relate to students and others. And I wanted to represent that uh, through this game. Uh, so my goal essentially was to create the game to make the user feel as anxious and as stressed as one can feel like especially in an academic setting. So here's some of my mechanic concepts. Uh, so the one on the left, I was uh, thinking of like an internal dialogue popping up as the character is running through something that's constantly popping up, reminding the character, um, you know, messages of self doubt, messages of concern, something to kind of stress out that player that's constantly reminding them. Uh, the other concept I was thinking of is something to physically like hinder the player. Um, and I thought, what better thing to use than homework to kind of represent that academic feel. Um, so the homework would, you know, uh, slow down the player, it would give the player something to avoid while trying to make it to the end. And so here is a video for the final product. Have to go. So, and here's the definition of noetic, just of two or relating to the mind. That's where I got my title from. Um, and I'll just kind of go through the title screen. And so you start as just a basic player. Um, there's no real identity to the player. I felt like that would be the best to kind of be more relatable to the person playing it. Um, you can see the homework there, slowing them down. Uh, I added like coins for points. Uh, there's a score you can reach at the end, and then the enemies that kind of follow through this nightmaric environment. Um, 
in the top right, there's the timer so that the player has, you know, uh, an obvious like time frame to, you know, rush them through. Um, and then you can see the dialogue going through. Uh, I have health items as well. And it is a pretty long level. It is pretty lengthy to find the key and to get to the end. Um, and I felt like I made it kind of difficult to get through. Uh, and then there's also like homework following that character as well to kind of speed it up towards the middle. And then there's the link for the game itself as well. Oh. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. We have time. Uh, yeah, no, I think that um, in terms of the presentation of it, yeah, I, I would, I would kind of jump onto what Annie's saying. It's like there are ways to look at the use of game as media for communication around emotion, right? It's a game as a method of of art practice or, or social communication, and it almost allows you to. And I haven't played it, so I can't say for sure. But like in some ways, using a very traditional platformer mechanic. It works, but there's space sometimes to almost subvert what somebody would normally want to do in that game because people understand what those game mechanics are. So I would say like in maybe future ways of, of kind of using games to talk about say your story or about people's, you know, emotional or, or mental health concerns or anxieties, right? Trying to find ways to almost use their understanding of, of video games to subvert those expectations rather than using a very like straightforward presentation of a game to do that. Uh, but once again, I haven't, I haven't played it all the way through, but yeah, I could see that being really fun. It was almost like the game becomes almost like self satiring uh, of how you use games to waste time or they distract people from what you're trying to do. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for I'm Kai Wall, this is Tyler Myers, and we are Blue Ship. Blue Ship is an interactive installation that tells a story of how blue whales have been impacted by humans. We hope to create an interactive and engaging experience that goes beyond a simple data set. By displaying data through a story and combining it with user interaction, the average person should know more about the human impact on an endangered species and want to protect them. Our statement of intent was, how can we display data in an engaging way that people will understand? Most ways of viewing large scale data aren't, aren't easily comprehensible and it makes pattern detection really difficult. With Blue Shift, we are making patterns easier to see and providing users a better understanding of the data. The purpose of making the physical installation was that users can interact with it and kind of uh, lead their own journey through the data that would also help further their understanding. So before we start the video, uh, you will see a user walk up to our installation. They will then press that beginning blue button. They will go through a linear journey following two whales and their migration patterns down on the west coast. They will then finally go to the last button, which will pull up a QR code. They can then scan that QR code and then go to a website where they can then donate um, or uh, just learn more information about whale migration or how humans are impacting that. Um, so, um, before we started making our prototypes, we did a, some research to kind of gain insight into what we wanted to create. So the first thing on the left side of the screen is from a museum in Houston that users get to like fully immerse themselves into this experience. They get to learn about this topic, um, which in this case was fossils and marine life. And we really wanted to try and like emulate that for ourselves and have the feeling of people being fully immersed in this experience. 
And the second one was from Tangible Engine 2, which is a tangible user interface um, that people can physically interact with and it kind of helps deepen their experience with what they're viewing and engaging, which is what we wanted to kind of emulate in our project. So for our prototypes, our original prototype that we came up with in RMPP uh, was quite different than what we have now. It was a simple acrylic screen, as you can see in the top uh, right-hand corner. It was placed on top of a box. Underneath that would be a stationary map that would be glued to that screen. And then there would be a grid of LEDs that would light up to show uh, different migration patterns. Um, and then the downside that we learned from this uh, through that final RMPP board, we decided to change to a screen. Uh, it would just allow for future updating and then uh, just allow for a more immersive experience. We could add more to the screen than just those light up LEDs. Uh, that led us to the first prototype in this class where we decided to uh, create uh, libraries in Python through that data and then map that out and then post that through processing onto that screen. Um, from that prototype, we found that processing was much too slow to actually render those out in real time. We then decided to render it out in Python and then upload it into a uh, Adobe After Effects to create the video, which is what we finally ended up playing each time a user clicks that button. Um, with those five stories, we started into our prototype three, where we actually started to build uh, some sort of enclosure installation for the screen, which you can see our first rendering in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, from that one, we learned we learned that we needed a larger installation, something that really drew people in. This is where we started to add LED lights and larger buttons to it, or larger sensors to it. Um, and then we also changed to one long story because we had all these buttons in the center. We felt that it was too jumbled. It didn't have a linear straight path where somebody could connect with the two whales from start to finish, where they would then want to donate or research more on it. Um, our fourth installation is where we put all that together and we were having a lot of issues with the sensors and we found that we were too focused on uh, using those specific sensors just to use those sensors. We're, it became too overly complicated and we were ignoring the user feedback. Um, that's where we changed to our solid arcade style buttons that everybody seemed to, uh, seemed to prefer in the end. And then these are photos of our final project. Um, we have that center acrylic screen, which is a, also an access panel where uh, the administrator can go and work on certain things. And we decided to add some LED lighting to draw people into it. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, real quick here. Annie, do you have the mic? Thanks. Uh, good presentation. Um, and I tried it when we were here, whenever that was. Um, but I had a question about, so briefly, you also showed a web, uh, something on the phone, a website, I guess, through the QR code. Um, are you imagining that most people would also do that or, you know, what's like the kind of the combination or how do they work together? Yeah, so we were hoping that after you do all the measures, you click that last button, which takes you to this QR code. And like the hope is that after you see everything, you scan the QR code and it finds you if you want to donate to help the process. Um, so that just goes to the most website if you're like a kind of push people who have like this spot. Or you can donate that without the app yet. Well, after you do it, you want to make a change to the app. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Ivey, and today I am presenting Embodied Awareness. So, what is Embodied Awareness? Embodied Awareness is a wearable garment designed to reduce the likelihood and intensity of chronic stress and to pr promote mindfulness. This garment is a personalized experience for users who live with or are predisposed to chronic stress. Before I go into the details of my own project, I'll be looking at similar products that exist already. The first, Apollo Neuro, is a wearable wrist strap that tracks heartbeat and heart rate variability to measure stress level. It communicates with the user via sound and vibration to notify them, claiming to strengthen and rebalance the autonomic nervous system. I like the idea of using um, something subtle and tactile to provide information to the user. 
I wanted to create something with a very similar goal, but in a different, more personalized manner. The second product is an app available on the Apple Watch called Mindfulness, previously known as Breathe. This app is mostly passive, recording heart rate periodically and checking for any major changes. It alerts the user if there's a dramatic change detected. The app can also be used manually to start a meditation session. What I like about this app is the clear message in promoting mindfulness through conscious action. I wanted to make something that spreads the same message, but through a different medium. Embodied awareness borrows aspects from both of these and combines them into something new. The ultimate goals of embodied awareness are to strengthen the connection between the user and their body and to promote mindfulness. Today, we live in a world where we are very vulnerable to stress. This stress can man manifest itself both physically and mentally, and is taxing on the mind and the body, pot potentially presenting health problems in both. Embodied awareness aims to combat chronic stress through intentional, deep diaphragm breathing, keeping, keeping the user in touch with their stress levels and their body in a gentle, personalized manner. This project is aimed towards those in inactive jobs prone to high stress, where it can be hard to keep in touch with your body. Although, although the idea behind embodied awareness hasn't always been, has, has always been to combat stress, the details of the project have changed many times since RMPP. At first, I really wanted to work with and manipulate heartbeat data to get an estimate of stress level. This heartbeat data would be translated into heart rate variability, also known as HRV, with a variation in time between heartbeats. This is a slightly more accurate measurement of stress than heart rate alone. I did multiple rounds of user testing with multiple types of heartbeat sensors, and it became clear that there was going to be some problems for me. Embedding a garment with sensors capable of accurately measuring heart rate proved to be much more of a challenge than I anticipated. Translating this heart rate data into HRV was also a little trickier than I expected. I felt like I needed something more reliable, more simple, and more passive as a form of input for my project. I also did multiple rounds of user testing involving the vibration feedback I was hoping to incorporate. I tested different strengths, locations, and experimented with motor drivers to achieve different vibration effects. After meetings with my mentors midway through the semester, my project idea pivoted. Instead of using a pre-made sensor to collect and manipulate data to get a sense of stress level, I started working on a stress sensor to measure how deeply the user was breathing. This is an alternate insight into the stress of the user. The idea here was simple. Track how deeply the user is breathing uh, over a period of time and give a gentle reminder to breathe deeply only when needed. Faster, shallower breaths can indicate signs of stress, while deeper, slower breaths can indicate the opposite. This new sensor changed the form of my garment again. Uh, so I began prototyping again, uh, working this time with different materials like sewable soft circuitry. The stretch sensor did prove to be more reliable than the previous sensors, but once again, I ran into problems with consistency and accuracy. It became clear that this garment could not work universally and would need to be tailored and learn to read data from each individual person who tried it. I wanted to retain some aspects of accessibility in the project, so now I aim to make embodied awareness slightly modular, allowing it to be swapped into multiple garments for the same person. So how does all this work? And how does embodied awareness give you feedback? As the stretch sensor is stressed, stretched, shown on the left here, um, this is interpreted as a breath out. As it contracts, a breath in. The intensity of each stretch can be related to the intensity of the user's breathing. Embodied awareness is constantly measuring and recording these breaths. If, over a period of time, no deep breathing is detected, the garment will prompt you to take a deep breath using vibration feedback. A vibration traveling slowly up the spine is a signal to take a deep breath in. A vibration traveling slowly down the spine is a breath out. There's a slight pause in between. This intentional and conscious exercise helps us transition away from the fight or flight stress response and towards the rest and digest response, essentially tricking our body into a more relaxed state. With intentional practice, this process helps us form a more intimate relationship between our mind and body and allows us to have more control over our own stress. Here's a couple of photos of the final iteration of the project. Uh, I embedded it into a vest. On the left, you can see uh, the vest, and on the right, you can see a close-up of the circuitry underneath. Um, here's a video showcasing a little bit more of uh, the final iteration.
All right. Uh, with that, thank you. And are there any questions? Kyle's so good. <laughs> I'm glad it worked because uh, I haven't talked to you in a while. Um, I guess I am, I mean, this isn't really a question, but I, I wanted to add something that wasn't in your presentation, which is that I think this has a really strong potential application for people with desk jobs specifically, right? Because that sensor, if you put it right around the low belly on that diaphragm area, people can make all kinds of arguments. Oh, if you're walking or whatever, it's going to stretch. But for people who are sitting, you know, um, at their desk or on an airplane or whatever, I think that this could potentially be um, really beneficial. And I'm glad that you were able to, to get this working. And also um, you said using breath as an indicator of stress level, but also right as a, um, to impact stress level. So yeah, slow, fast, shallow breathing indicates you are stressed, but also it, you know, it's one of the most scientifically reproducible ways to lower cortisol is just deep breaths. Um, so I think it's a really, really good project. And I'm glad to see it. If anybody else wants to say something. I don't know what we're at time was. Yeah. Okay. Great job, Kyle. I'm so stoked. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, my name is Kylie Buchan and welcome to BitMetRx. So when I was 14 years old, I had a really intense long eight hour surgery and afterwards a mix up of medications led to anaphylactic shock and actually a very long stay in the ICU. So this life threatening situation was simply due to an incorrect medication in my health record. Um, and this situation was really eye opening to me in terms of the problems that exist. Um, that are software based within medicine today. So introducing BitMetRx, which redesigns the user experience of electronic health record systems, um, emphasizing integrated, customizable uh, and visual interfaces for patients, clinicians and medical researchers. So my main goal with this project is to reduce fragmentation across the many different electronic health record systems that exist, uh, while also increasing patient advocacy. So what are some of the current problems that exist with the current EHRs or electronic health record systems? Uh, to start off, they're text-based. So clinicians have to sort through lots of bodies of text in order to find the information that they're looking for. Number two, there's a lot of duplicated information. So this came up consistently in my user interviews, especially. Say one piece of information would be in seven different forms on the same system. Um, number three, the expectation of a templated approach, which can be really dangerous. So Obviously, medicine is, is incredibly complicated, um, and a templated approach to medicine can lead to medical errors and neglect of a patient's experience. Number four, these systems are fragmented. So there's a lot of different electronic health record companies that exist, and they don't talk to each other, which means that medical records are fragmented for patients, um, in addition to communication across uh, clinicians. And then finally, lack of patient involvement. Um, it's really hard as a patient to access your medical records and currently there's not a system that exists where you can create a lifelong health record for yourself. So you're looking at some screenshots of current EHR interfaces. This is Epic Systems. Epic Systems is currently the most popular electronic health record company currently used in over 250 hospitals in the United States. Um, and as you can see, a lot of the problems that I was just talking about, these interfaces are really archaic and text-based. Um, and frustrating for clinicians because they have to sort through all this text rather than focusing on critical medicine. So as you can tell, why does this matter? Uh, my personal example is great, I think, in I had a fragmented health record. And so that led to a medicine distribution error. Um, and I think we can all see how many life-threatening errors that could occur because of this. Uh, additionally, patient advocacy. So you as a patient should have access to your records and my goal is to cre create a lifelong health record that essentially follows you from birth until death, regardless of the hospital network you're being treated at. So with that being said, let's look at BitMetRx and how this design could kind of improve the future of medicine. Um, we have a simple login screen where clinicians can use hospital administered credentials. 
to log in and access kind of this patient home hub where they're able to see all the patients that they're currently caring for. Next, our, our homepage uh, really uses the visual layout approach. So at a very quick glance, clinicians are able to see all patient information. So this includes clinician orders, medications, messaging notes, and medical history. Um, on the left navigation bar, there's further patient information uh, to access if needed. And then additionally, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, clinicians can easily switch between patient profiles without having to go all the way back to the patient hub. So by condensing the endless amounts of uh, options that there are for clinicians, uh, this interface allows clinicians to access exactly what they need in a very concise way. So we can see small category options, um, as well as a clear daily calendar that allows clinicians to access exactly what they need. And then in terms of connecting hospital networks, uh, messages could be sent either in hospital or across different hospital networks to different physicians. Um, and this allows a patient to receive holistic care regardless of treatment location. So now a patient uh, treatment team can have a central line of communication. And this is something that's completely absent from current electronic health record systems. And then in terms of customizability, obviously different clinicians have different needs. Um, therefore, I wanted to ensure that the interface design of BitMetaRx allows clinicians to display exactly what they want. So as you can see in both the notes and medical history section, there's a lot of customizability here. Um, and then uh, for medical history specifically, clinicians can choose to either view information in this picture or a more grid view if they're looking for something very specific. And then in terms of medical history, this is a drastic improvement from the current electronic health record systems, um, mainly due to the anatomical and visual layout um, the ability to establish a patient's lifelong health history and the ability to confirm accurate patient information directly with the patient themselves. So the goal is, of this is no longer would you have to go to a doctor's office and on paper fill out your medical history by memory, what you think you can remember, uh, but rather it would all exist here in this system that you as a patient could connect directly with the clinician themselves and this would follow you for life regardless of which physician you're seeing. And I think equally as important as the clinician portal is the patient experience themselves. Um, so this is really emphasizing patient advocacy and you can establish this lifelong health record as well as confirm information that is consistent with hospital data on the clinician portal side. So this is, you're looking at some of my early sketches and wireframes for this project. Obviously, this project started all the way back in January, so I had many iterations of sketches, wireframes, high fidelity mockups. Um, I had user interviews, three rounds of user testing, two rounds of mentor reviews, and a lot more, as a lot of us did. So um, this project was really challenging, but I think it also kind of sparked some inspiration. Um, I think it's actually really rare in our generation to find a problem that needs disruption and there's so many innovative solutions. It was surprising to me to look at those interfaces that we saw at the very beginning and know that that's what's being used today. Um, and obviously it's in needs, need of so much improvement. Um, so here are some links to my clinician, patient portals, as well as case study. I hope you all get the chance to kind of go through these and join me in changing the way we think of medicine. So thank you all so much. Are there any questions? All right, next up, here we go. Okay. All right, so my name is Mitchell Cohen. I am the executive producer at Anthem Music Enterprises, and my capstone project was the Virtual Artist Playbook, which is to help independent artists live sustainably through music. So during the pandemic, um, a lot of these revenue streams were heavily, heavily affected. There's 10 basic revenue streams for every independent artist and five of them were cut due to the pandemic. The biggest loss was obviously live shows. Um, there were no live shows during the pandemic and this accounts for 50% of all independent artist revenue. So that was a huge loss. 
In addition, uh, $10 billion in sponsorships and grants were also cut because of a crashing economy. And with unemployment skyrocketing to 17% in the pandemic, uh, consumer spending basically was eliminated, uh, which eliminated social media revenue, merchandising, and fan subscriptions, which really left us with five streams of revenue. And these were shaky at best. Um, song sales fell by about 10%, but then hovered around there. Uh, crowdfunding really depends on your ability to network as an independent artist. Uh, streaming, we're going to talk more about that later. Sync licensing only accounts for 2% of independent artist revenue, and features also depend on your network. So before the pandemic, average independent artist revenue was hovering at about $30,000, and during the pandemic, that went down to about $11,000. Uh, so you'd be better working at McDonald's. Honestly, you would make more money during the pandemic working at a fast food restaurant than you would making music. Uh, so this is a huge problem. Uh, certain streaming platforms did their best to really try to keep up independent artist revenue. Uh, once a month, Bandcamp decided to donate 100% of their streaming revenue to their independent artists, which led to about $4.3 million on that day, one day a month, going back to independent artists. Spotify added a section of their app for fans to be able to donate to independent artists. Twitch and Instagram TV added exclusive membership sections of their applications so that um, creators could basically make paid content on those apps. And YouTube decided to donate a larger portion of their ad spend to creators. Um, all of these things were great at the app level, but there's no, there hasn't really been any consideration into how we can look broader at how independent artists are connecting with fans, sponsors, and potential collaborators. So in a post-COVID world, how can independent artists effectively reach potential fans, sponsors, and collaborators to capitalize on the revenue streams that matter most to them? And this is really what I wanted to focus on. I wanted to focus on the user experience for these people to actually be connecting with independent artists so that independent artists can turn a bigger profit, make more revenue, and capitalize on their revenue streams. So to combat the effects of COVID-19 on independent artist revenue streams, I worked with four artists that I've already been doing other projects with to help them basically return on their investment into us as a company with the music we're making for them so that they can really capitalize on their revenue streams and return on their investment. So in talking to my immediate network of independent artists, I asked them what they're currently doing uh, to promote themselves. And I found some really big mistakes that they're making. Uh, boosting posts on social media is incredibly ineffective. Um, there's other ways to advertise on Facebook, but hitting the little boost post button is just a big money suck. Uh, putting all your eggs in one revenue stream basket is not effective at all. Uh, you really need to spread your investment across multiple revenue streams in order to return on investment. Performing without selling merchandise is kind of like being a bartender or a waitress without tips. Uh, merchandise is really your tip jar when you're performing at live shows. If you don't know how to network as an independent artist, um, you're not going to get very far. If you don't have a label backing you, you need to be your own biggest advocate. Uh, not monetizing a following. If you have a big following on social media, but you're not doing anything to monetize that following, then it, it's pretty worthless. And if you don't have a social media presence at all, uh, social media is free. Uh, as independent artists, you need to be capitalizing on that as much as you can because it's a free resource. So basically what I did was I redesigned the user flow for how independent artists uh, connect with uh, fans, sponsors, and collaborators. So this is an example of a user flow for a merchandising campaign where an independent artist would be connecting with fans. At the entry point, there would be a basic level of reach ads designed to reach every single person in one target market once. If those people interact with those ads, they're then retargeted with a more purposed advertisement, something a little more intimate with the artist to help the potential fan connect with that artist more. Finally, they would be retargeted one more time with a call to action where they would then go to the website, they would go to the shop on the website, which should be easily found, and then they would add everything to their cart, complete the order, and that would be the complete user flow for a merchandise campaign. So this is great and fun to look at, um, but what does that actually mean in terms of visual content? So let's look at a case study for one of the artists I work with. This is Vinny. He is a 30-year-old rapper in the Denver area. Um, his the revenue streams that he wanted to focus on the most and that made the most sense after talking with him were 
live shows, features, and merchandise. And his target areas are Denver, the greater Colorado area, New York City, and North Carolina. So basically in utilizing that user flow that I just explained, um, this would be what level one advertisements would look like. They would be very basic design to reach the most people possible. If one of them piques their interest, they would be retargeted with something a little more purposed. Um, and in the case of merchandise, if I interacted with that merchandising ad again, I would see a call to action with a new merchandise drop. I would then go to the website and I would be able to uh, make that transaction relatively quickly. So that felt smooth, right? That felt super easy, uh, super concise. So let's look more at the website. Um, websites for uh, independent artists are very, very simple. They're supposed to be very smooth. Um, and basically what I did was I looked at every single web component and then I cross-referenced that with the different revenue streams that I mentioned earlier. And for Vinny, we picked out these top web components to be the most useful for what he's trying to capitalize on. So with that website UX, especially with independent artists where you're trying to get fast sales, you never want someone to have to click more than three times to be able to get exactly where they need to go, which is what we did when we were designing the website. So the website is simple, it's simple on purpose. Um, and, and that's, again, it's really intentional to make sure that these transactions are happening as seamlessly as possible, because especially when you're going from social media to a website, that's where you lose the most of your conversion. So um, in addition to the website, I've also designed a social media branding kit for Vinny. This is basically going to be the aesthetic for what he's um, posting on social media. Um, it's really, really important as an artist on social media to be um, aesthetically uh, representing yourself in the best way possible so that people can resonate with your branding. So the last component that I built out for Vinny is an electronic press kit. Um, in the in creative industries, these don't really work, um, especially when you're an independent artist, you really need to be showing people what you do and not telling them. So an electronic press kit is a resume in video format. It's a lot more useful. So these were the three deliverables that I had left Vinny with, the website, the social media brand kit, and the electronic press kit. And basically after utilizing uh, everything that I've given him, we're hoping that Vinny goes from 10 shows, $15,000 in revenue in the last year and three features to this next year being projected to have 25 shows, $35,000 in revenue and 10 features. Thank you. Really great slides and presentation style and um, clear setup of the why this is important with all the stats at the beginning. I really appreciate that. Um, but I'm wondering moving forward, with this, I get the sense this is your business, perhaps, or something. Yeah. Um, moving forward with this, when will you find out from Vinny if this worked, or do you already have any information about if this worked? Like that last slide, I got from the language use the impression that that was a hope. Right. But do you have evidence of sort of your um, user flow and these different uh, products you're creating for independent artists having positive outcomes for them? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so the first instance of this really being used was actually my business partner, his name is JJ. Um, so when we implemented all of these individual components with him, we saw this level of growth with him and his revenue streams that he was looking at. Um, and we kind of translated that those projections to Vinny. Ultimately, um, this is what I've created for him. He has all the materials now. Um, so it's up to him on how consistent he is with using it, um, how active he is with networking. Um, obviously, like I gave him the social media brand kit, for example, but if he doesn't follow those aesthetic guidelines, there's nothing I can do on my end. Mm -hmm. um, when I talked to him and I gave him this stuff, I said, look, um, based on all the research I've done, based on everything that we've seen so far, if you follow steps A, B, and C, this is your projected outcome for next year. So ultimately, it's up to the independent artists to be able to use these tools and mm -hmm. think of themselves really as a business owner and an independent artist with the value. So. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.
Hello and welcome. We are admitting. My name is Maddie. I'm Andrew. I'm Sophie. I'm Pooh. All right. And so knitting is an immersive sculptural installation inside the incredible Black Box Experimental Theater in the Atlas Building. And it uses projection mapping and to interactively express and explore feelings of loneliness and isolation. Through our project, we're exploring what loneliness feels like to different people and how this is part of the collective human experience. Um, this is the background theme behind our project, but it's not something we forced on the people who experienced it. It was more of a suggestion. So in some of our um, research to um, developing this project, we found that approximately 60% approximately of all Americans feel lonely sometimes um, based on surveys. Uh, studies have also shown that loneliness can actually be linked to several different health issues um, and that um, this feeling tends to be reported most amongst people our own age. Um, another study was conducted among healthcare workers who are actually shown um, art depicting these emotions and it was reported that they were more likely to feel empathy surrounding others experiencing it. So with our precedents, um, there are countless uh, amazing digital installations out there in the world to draw inspiration from. Um, the ones we have on here are Jack. It's a uh, an interactive installation in which you uh, stand in front of this thing and like an animation plays on the sculpture which is being projected back onto um, Team Lab, Dark Side, and uh, many others. But the main idea that we wanted to draw from was um, the sense of interaction and storytelling and immersion. And uh, through the research of the previous installations, we sort of got a rough idea of type of structure to theme that we needed and uh, the sort of materials that we needed to create. So. And because our project had a lot of interactive components, the key point in the prototyping process was to keep them continually in sync and talking to each other while we were iterating the visual and interactive design. Um, and beyond that, because we had a final showing in the black box, we had to make sure that we were preparing to make sure every system could work with their systems and uh, really take advantage of the space as much as we could. Uh, and so here you can see on the left, a kind of visual representation of how we used a connect depth sensor with sensor or with skeleton tracking to track the audience in front of the sculptures and send that data to a computer, a uh, kind of more complicated diagram on the right shows how that generates a uh, procedural visual projection mapping and visual. Uh, we began by constructing two large scale structures. Um, we originally planned on making these out of chicken wire and paper mache, but we later decided to do laser cut cardboard instead. And this proved to be a lot more time effective and allowed for more precise projection mapping. So once everything was assembled, we uh, added plaster and paint to create a, a textured yet polished finish to the sculptures. Um, we built stands to give them a, a floating effect in the black box. Um, and during the setup process, we mapped the sculptures so that the animations would align with um, all of the precise angles of the sculpture, um, which you can sometimes see uh, in the, the process video. So um, in terms of the background visuals that we wanted to project behind the sculptures, um, artist designer, um, it's a node based programming language like specifically Sort of modeling simulations. And uh, yeah, so we kind of just had to go through this whole process of like not knowing what to do until we got to the black box because, like, we weren't sure what kind of technology they had. That's the sort of downside of it, but how obvious the impact of the black box was. So we had to go and buy our hardware with download like a 
external programs in order to map the background visuals to be able to sort of single image um, as you see like on the bottom left with one image between three times versus a single image that is continuous along the span of the And so um, with that, all of our project components um, together here, we also had um, the uh, addition of sound in our projects in which we collaborated with um, a former graduate and friend of ours who de uh, developed a 25 minute track which we could loop through during the installation. And we actually hooked that up to the black boxes Amazonic sound system. So they have like this 3D sound thing we also hooked that up to Andrew's um, depth data, and so the sound would also be interactive and flying across the space when we point at them. So we have the sculptures here in the background visuals and the sound. Uh, which leads to our final projects, which is just the accumulation of everything that we just talked about. And um, we felt like it was incredibly successful uh, in terms of like the number of people who showed up. Um, probably 50, 60 plus people in the span of two days. And uh, yeah, we're just incredibly thankful for everybody that got the chance to, to come out. Oh, so uh, uh, in reflection, um, it was incredibly rewarding to see uh, how everyone interacted differently um, with our project um, and kind of listen to what they took from it. Um, there was a lot of feedback that we got uh, at the time of the show, and um, in the end, I think that's all we really wanted, so. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I think that's our last slide. Thanks, that was, that was awesome. I, I wanted to ask you, during this whole process, it had so many pieces. What, what would you say was the largest obstacle that you ran into? Um, so, I think part of it is getting all the pieces to talk to each other. Uh, there's a lot of kind of connections involved and different like needs of OSC signals and data system. So, I think there's some like, HDMI ports and some black box. Um, and another kind of point that we kind of mentioned is that black box type thing. We kind of tried to get into any workshop we could play around with. Beyond that, I think it was also kind of a key feedback point was to give these um, separate individual kind of things to really kind of like gain around this. Um, I think we had a great product and in the initial stages it was it was kind of just it was it was a cool thing, but uh, it progressed in the And that was the other thing I was going to ask. Uh, I think Maddie mentioned that you got a lot of feedback. Um, I don't know, like, what would you say was like a main takeaway or feedback that you got or suggestions for anyone doing something similar in the future or if you continued with it? Yeah, what was the main takeaway for feedback? Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, like I said, I think the main feedback we got was to really hit the one this thing hard as we could. Like, we didn't want to be too blunt with it because it's kind of an environmental space that we wanted people to play around in. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also wanted to have like a pretty clear representation of physical distance to the motion. Well, the other thing we did, I definitely got a range of uh, like opinions from friends who came. Um, each person had something different to say about like how it made them feel and they touched a lot on like the range of emotion that sometimes you won't even see from friends, but you can still feel calm and content and happy while feeling alone and isolated. But um, there's quite a range, and everyone has something different to say. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, so good. Okay, last but not least.
Here we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. hello. Last but not least, my name is Ia Rafelson, and today I'm going to be introducing you to Collideo. So, um, that didn't come up right. I've always been drawn to complex and beautiful visuals. They have the power to take you away from your thoughts and transport you into the full awareness. However, since I bought this kaleidoscope the, at an art fair in 2017, its organic uniqueness and fluidity has brought me back more than any other digital medium. But as you can imagine from this photo, it's not the most comfortable experience holding a kaleidoscope for, to one eye for an ex extended period of time. So I wondered, how can I improve the kaleidoscope viewing experience? The solution that I sought out was to design a way to record the inside of a kaleidoscope live so that it can be projected for many people to watch comfortably together. Kind of like how you all are right now with the video on the right. So now that I have presumably figured this out, I am here presenting to you all after all, what was the best way that I could showcase this invention? I projected my own kaleidoscope into the Fisk Planetarium with accompanying music for a one-of-a-kind, visually mind-altering experience. So what makes this difference? different? Immersive visuals and interactive experiences have been around for a long time and designed in different ways. On the left is an installation in Las Vegas, Meow Wolf location, where buttons control generative visuals on a, on a screen. It is interactive, yet it lacks the encompassing immersion of a big screen that allows multiple people uh, to enjoy together. It is also digitally structured like the immersive exhibit that we see on the right, which lacks interactivity. When it comes to filming the inside of a real analog kaleidoscope for this sort of purpose, there was only one project that existed so far, which was made by Roberta Brittingham and kaleidoscope maker Michael Collier for use at large meditation events led by the world renowned Dr. Joe Dispenza. At his meditation events, he plays pre uh, a, the pre recorded video to induce a trance like state in the audience before implanting a seed of inspiration. Um, the difference with my project is that it has the capability to be fully live, never to be seen again in the same way. Like musicians jamming at an improv concert, I have made a visual instrument that can be played live without ever getting the same exact result twice. It combines all the elements that I am passionate about, interactivity, immersion, and it's uniquely analog. To begin, I felt it was very important to learn how to make my own kaleidoscopes so that I could have full control over the visuals. I, be I began my journey into this craft with a children's kit and then learned traditional construction of cutting and assembling front surface mirrors and filling cells like you see on the right with interesting materials and silicon oil to add a distinguished fluidity in the visuals of the kaleidoscope. Now it was time to figure out the best way to record the inside. After testing several webcams, I found that my iPhone was by far the best camera to use for this invention. Conveniently, people have already designed cases for these devices that hold them tightly. So the idea is to connect a phone case to a block of hard material, in this case styrofoam, which holds the kaleidoscope in perfect position for my camera lens, similar to where your eye would be if you were looking through it in a traditional manner. While the styrofoam was nice, I was and I was incredibly pleased with the content that I was capturing, every time I put the kaleidoscope in and out of the enclosure, pieces of styrofoam would fall into the mirrors which was really no fun because now you're looking at a kaleidoscope of styrofoam, not, not nice. I quickly found that, the, that wood suited the enclosure much more. As I continued exploring lighting the kaleidoscope in different ways, I came up with this idea to put LEDs down the barrel of the kaleidoscope and that would illuminate the cells from the inside. Using an Arduino and some potentiometer knobs, I could control the LEDs and program them to behave in different ways for different lighting effects. I knew at this point I was close, but the enclosure was awkward to hold. And I found that the knobs were confusing because you couldn't easily glance down and check the position 
that they were currently in. For my final enclosure, I was inspired by a steering wheel. When you're driving a car, you can turn the car and change the volume of whatever song you're listening to all at the same time without moving your hands. I essentially needed the same thing. The knobs turned into faders and so that, um, so that as you're holding the enclosure with your hands on the inside of the holes, your thumbs are conveniently positioned to be able to change the faders as you're um, steering it and causing movement um, in the cells. And, or if you're happy with the lights, you can drive on cruise control with your hands on the outside grip like I am in the left picture. Um, in addition to the enclosed LEDs, I also utilized LED gloves, which you can see on my right hand in this picture, and an LED bucket, which is um, at the bottom there, which the kaleidoscope is being dipped into. Um, and this is another behind the scenes look at the enclosure. You can see on the top picture, I can actually pull off the cell. Um, and then you're looking at the LEDs inside there, as well as that triangle is the mirrors. And the cell, I actually have seven different cells that I made so far um, that I can interchange live. And each of them are unique um, with different objects inside just to create a totally different aesthetic um, with each cell. And as you can see, it's a real kaleidoscope in the bottom GIF that we're looking at. Um, as you look into it, it's just where my phone is positioned. Um, to present my project, I'm just so grateful to have put on two special shows in the Fisk Planetarium. This is the poster I designed. Um, and for those who stayed for both shows, I created two unique experiences. The, the intention of the first show was to give the, op the audience an opportunity to reset, calm down. The second show was a bit more energetic and I called it recharge. And at the end, there was ample time for the audience to play the instrument themselves, bringing an interactive component to the journey. And I'm just gonna play you a quick couple seconds of my recap video, which there's no sound, but that's okay. Um, it's just music playing, so um, yeah. Thank you all for coming today. It's been a it's been a trip. It's been a it's been a ride getting all the way through this. I'm you know, real proud of how that final control it turned out. It's really really nice work. I wonder. So you mentioned like one potential application of this um, in terms of like where it might go. Do you see yourself like using this as something that you want to use as a performer or as something that you might enable other people with? What do you think is sort of the like future of this kind of tool thing that you're working with? Yeah, so primarily for now, I see it. Uh, yeah. um, primarily for now, I see myself using it uh, just for myself as a performer to go along with concert visuals, um, concerts, and then also add, like figuring out how to add more digital effects and layering it so I can like mix it up and doing a full like hour long concert so it's not just the flat the entire time. Uh, and also thinking about just recording like pre recorded loops for other digital content creators to use sure. in that sense. Eventually, I thought about manufacturing these and selling them so that other people like have an instrument so they can learn how to play it that way. Um, you know, make some NFTs probably. <laughs> Yeah, why not? Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential for different applications of this. That's the, that's the, what feels special about a, a thing like this is that you're like, oh, there's a really cool performance and application. And then you think like, oh, well, there's a lot of variable paths, whether it's for you or other people. I mean, I could see this thing being mounted into something that's sonically reactive, right? So you could just do something that's almost like mm -hmm. immediately triggered by input sounds or other data inputs, which would be really fun to think about other collaborations with the people that create different types of media and then how do you connect them to this so I, i'm excited to see if, if new stuff comes out of this thank you yeah it's just the beginning i really feel that way and yeah the other thing i didn't mention was i'd love to do a full interactive installation like permanent installation somewhere with this whole thing set up and like have the way that people can create their own like live performance and like create their own like interactive world and then have that yeah you have like hide it in a ball or something yeah. like that but yeah very cool nice
Oh, sorry, I muted myself for you guys on Zoom. Yeah, I did that. I did that. That's good. Okay, if I could ask for one more round of applause for everybody. I just want to say um, from a personal note, just how much of a privilege it was to um, see all of your projects come to fruition. I'm really proud of all of you. So great, great job, everybody. And good luck with the remainder of the semester. Okay, we're here for you in the future as well. So don't like stay in touch with us, please. Um, Again, congratulations, everybody. Really, really great job. Woo!